Hey everyone, um, we're going to start in just a few minutes, so um, bear with us. It'll be about four minutes. I'm Wendy Equipment, and I wanted to cover just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, during the presentation, there will be six multiple choice questions to answer by poll vote. You will click on the answer that you think is correct, hit the submit button, and then we'll post the results and move on to the next slide. To receive your operator and New York State PE credit for this webinar, you must complete these poll questions during the presentation. If you can't answer the poll questions for some technical reason, you need to take it out of full screen mode. We found that that works better for some people. Or if you still are having issues, you could always put the uh, type the answer in the question box. In order to get credits though, you will need to finish the poll questions. Um, the question box is also there for questions after this webinar if time allows. In addition to receiving your New York State PE credit and DEC credits for this webinar, you also have to complete a survey at the end of the presentation. So please stay connected until you complete that evaluation. Um, there's also a certificate of completion and a full PDF of the presentation that are attached in the handout section. There's a drop down menu with three handouts. Um, and that pretty much wraps up the announcements. I'd like to introduce Eric Hess and Andrew McBeardy, both from FR Mahoney. And with that, thanks and enjoy the webinar. Uh, thank you, Wendy. So this is Andrew McBeardy. I'm uh, Director of Engineering at, at Mahoney & Associates. Uh, we're going to discuss the Submerged Task Growth Bioreactor process. Um, and part of this will include some of the uh, some of the, oops, sorry, will include the forms of nitrogen in wastewater, how this, this nitrogen gets converted through the biological process. Um, since this is a submerged attached growth bioreactor, we're going to briefly discuss how this biofilm uh, works on the system. Go through briefly control some performance uh, advantages. And then uh, since the amphidrome system, which FR Mahoney has, is a submerged attached with bioreactor, we have some photographs of some installations of, of this particular unit. Then we'll have any questions that, that anyone has. So, so to get started, the uh, the Submerge, this is a biologically active filter. And so a biological filter is a fixed film reactor and we have a large surface area and consequently a large biomass that can, can uh, treat the wastewater. Now, as an example, the amphidrome system has an equivalent biomass of a suspended growth system with uh, mixed liquor solids of uh, 26,000 milligrams per liter. So it's a fairly, fairly large amount of biomass available uh, in a fairly small footprint. Uh, part of the characteristics of this uh, bioreactor, a, a SAGB, is that the media is always submerged in this process flow. Now, the advantage of this is the media not being constantly wetted and, and dry allows, allows the biomass to have a fairly comfortable, as it were, environment to, to reside in. And this bacteria is attached to the media, so you don't, don't run the risk of washouts that you sometimes get in suspended growth. Um, now the advantages, we've sort of discussed the, the high concentration of viable biomass. And because we have this, this media that through which the uh, wastewater is essentially being filtered, 
there's no separate solid separation. Um, you don't don't necessarily have a clarifier or some, and so, and the biomass actually provides a, uh, a sort of as an extra filtering ability because of its you know basic sort of stickiness. Um, now the media. Now this is media specific to our system, but it's a pretty pretty general uh, means of if if you're using this this silica sand, it's uh, spherical so that you don't have flat spots. Uh, we try and stay within uh, you know very tight diameter, uh, three to three point two millimeters. So it's a it's a coarse sand. Uh, had some arguments with my daughter who, when I showed her some of it, she said, that's not sand, that's gravel, but that's, uh, it's, it's sand. So it's got a 35 to 40% porosity. So you've got, uh, uh, some, a very high specific surface area. And that's equivalent to, uh, 250 square feet per cubic foot. So you've got a large surface area with this media on which to grow your, your biomass. And uh, this is a, a, a SAGBY system. The reactor in the middle is the uh, is an amphidrome reactor. The the media is water filters through the media and then into the clear well. And this is a an amphidrome system. And just as a side note, the amphidrome is not a made up term. It actually is a oceanography definition where the tide vanishes to zero so it's it has to do with how the uh, amphidrome process actually is is handled and and with our returns there's several reasons to use a, a sagby uh one is a small print footprint uh you look at this uh you know this 250 square foot per cubic foot you have a large surface area for your biomass. So you get a small footprint. It can handle low flow conditions. You've got uh, the ability because, as I mentioned, the, the media is submerged. So as you grow this biomass, it, it's, it can handle low flow conditions as, as well as you know, your design flow. So it's good for seasonal. Uh, and, you know, just, and it's, a really economical way to produce a discharge of less than 10 milligrams per liter of total nitrogen. Um, now I, I state this using a, uh, a system I'm familiar with and uh, it has a reactor that nitrifies and then a polishing filter that actually denitrifies both being SAGBs. Um, that takes us to uh, the first poll question. Okay, uh, hold on a second. I'll launch the first poll question. The question is, what does SAGB stand for? Please select one. And after you select it, don't forget to hit the submit button. Looks like most everyone has already voted, 86% of you. I'll give you another two seconds or so. Okay, we'll close the poll. And I'll share the answers. The answer is a submerged attached growth bio, biological reactor. And about 100% of you got that right. Good job. Great, thank you. Sure. So, so the next uh, section of this presentation is is talking about the nitrogenous compounds. Uh, these are the compounds that uh, we're largely focusing on removing, uh, and they consist of your organic nitrogen, which is your ammonium, and the uh, they're the long chain carbonaceous molecules. Uh, the uh, there's 
the organic nitrogen is, is TKN minus the ammonia. And so, so that's your organic nitrogen. Then you have ammonia and ammonium. You then have nitrite and nitrate as your nitrogenous compounds you're trying to get rid of. Uh, typically, some states don't use TKN. They actually use ammonia plus nitrate and nitrite. Uh, but most states use total nitrogen as TKN plus nitrate plus nitrite. And that TKN, as we covered, is the ammonia plus organic nitrogen. And uh, nitrite is fairly unstable. Usually that's a fairly low uh, value. And the uh, nitrate is your, your stable more stable compound. Usually that's what you get after you aerate your, uh, through the aerobic process. Uh, now, one thing about TKN is the ammonia values, if if you only sample for ammonia in your raw waste, that's about 60% of the total killed all nitrogen. Um, and now much of the organic nitrogen will be removed in the settled sludge. And the, the TKN actually is about 15 to 20% of the BOD of this raw sewage. So it's just, just some, some side notes about, about TKN because when, when we're designing and when, when you are considering designs for nitrogen, uh, TKN should be what you're, what you're using as your, your starting point for nitrogen removal. So, and there is some some portion of TKN that cannot be biologically decomposed. And uh, as I said, this is the TKN, the total minus the ammonia. Uh, now, what what I was at a seminar, and there's there's that that refractory nitrogen is apparently a, a, a very old form of nitrogen, it, it, it would take a huge effort to break it. So there's there's a portion of, of TKN that that really you can't break. And, uh, you know, that that's why I think some states do use uh, not TKN, but ammonia and nitrate and nitrite. Um, so there, there are three major steps to convert uh, your nitrogen to your nitrogen compounds to nitrogen gas. You got a modification, which is the conversion of your soluble organic nitrogen to ammonia. And then you got nitrification, which takes that uh, ammonia and then it converts it to nitrate. And your denitrification, which converts the nitrate to gaseous nitrogen. And so, so for a modification, uh, that is a heterotrophic biomass. It's a, it, the biology uses oxygen, but it does not use a, an organic carbon source. And this is important for, for your design and troubleshooting. Again, you have to convert this ammonia to, uh, to nitrogen. And then the, the nitrification is your conversion of that. So first your ammonia is converted to nitrite, and then your nitrite, that should be nitrite, is converted to nitrate. So it's it's two steps. So your nitrate is, nitrite is a very unstable compound. Um, if you have high levels of nitrite, it it should throw a flag if you're if you're running operations or 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 looking at uh, the system because it it is fairly unstable, and it's it's interesting if you when we go to the denitrification that it actually goes from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate, and then the nitrate has to get converted back to nitrite in order to to break the nitrate down. Uh, so. So for the ammonia conversion, uh, your first step with the nitrous ammonia bacteria uh, takes the ammonia and an oxygen and your bicarbonate alkalinity. 
again, an inorganic carbon source. So it takes the, it takes the bicarbonate alkaline. That's why alkalinity is important. And then, it, so that converts the, uh, the ammonia to nitrite, and then the nitrite again with an oxygen source plus additional alkalinity, and then a different uh, bacteria, the nitrobacter, gives you your nitrate. And just a, a little graphic is uh, it's interesting to note that uh, to convert one part of ammonia takes 4.6 parts of oxygen, so it takes a reasonable amount of oxygen. And one of the keys is this. 7.1 parts of alkalinity. Uh, so if you if you're ever troubleshooting a plant or or less partly for design too, if you have a, a high high ammonia, high PKN, you're gonna need you know this this high amount of, of bicarbonate alkalinity to convert it. Uh, domestic waste typically you don't have um, you don't have uh, any and too much of an issue with with the naturally occurring alkalinity to be able to convert the the ammonia, but uh, if you get to schools, you get to special special uh, systems that have high ammonia. You may you really need to be aware of the, of the alkalinity requirement. Oxygen is fairly easy; you just hit it with more air, but you you know. Without that alkalinity, no matter how much air you give it, you're still going to not break that ammonia. So uh, now we go to questions two and three. Sure. Okay, I'll launch question two first, and uh, here it goes. Hold on. Is carbon required for nitrification? A yes, no, B. No, sorry. Okay, we have about the majority of you have voted. Give you about two more seconds. All right, closing the poll. And the answer is no, it's not required for nitrification. He hasn't covered denitrification yet, but my guess is that'll be the case. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. Poll question three What is the ratio of bicarbonate alkalinity to ammonia for nitrification? One to one, five to one, seven to one, ten to one. Okay, it looks like the majority of you have voted. I'm going to close the poll. The answer is C, seven to one, and 83% of you got it right. Good job. All right, I'm gonna go back to the uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, now, one thing, it, it occurs to me that second question, or the first question in this poll, it actually should have said organic carbon because it's it actually, the carbon from alkalinity is, is an inorganic, but anyway. I'll fix that later. So, uh, so that as, and so we are going to denitrification now, which is the conversion of, of your nitrate to a gaseous nitrogen. Uh, it's many, we're, it uses a heterotrophic bacteria, and this requires an organic carbon source. So, so a couple notes here. The when you denitrify, you actually recover some of the alkalinity. So again, on an operations side of things, if you're addressing issues and they say, well, we seem to have adequate alkalinity, but still can't convert. Uh, if they're sampling after you've denitrified, 
you actually have regained some alkalinity, so it sort of misleads you. You need to check the alkalinity where you're doing the nitrification. So, and and the other key issue for denite is your anoxic conditions because uh, the, these bacteria are are sort of like me, very lazy, and will will take take the most available source of oxygen possible. Um, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, the for denitrification, there's several sources of, of uh, organic carbon. Uh, you could use influent wastewater, which has some, you know, the BOD is actually an organic carbon. Uh, I've seen acetate used, ethanol. Uh, most common are are the methanol and micro C, and uh, in theory, you could use hydrogen. I uh, I don't know if I'd use that, but uh, it's an interesting. I guess if you had a lot available, you could you could do that. Uh, so, in denitrification, so respiration, as you know, is just simply a, a pathway in which molecular oxygen or some other oxidant uh, serves as a terminal electron electron acceptor. So. So in this, in denitrification, you know, typically uh, oxygen is used for for this for this respiration. Now in denitrification, we can actually use the the bacteria actually use the nitrate. So so nitrate has an oxidation state of plus five, and for nitrogen gas, which is neutral, it has an oxidation oxidation state of zero. Um, so here you've got the the steps. So it goes from nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide, and then to nitrous oxide, and then to nitrogen gas. And then the nitrogen gas is released to the atmosphere. Okay, poll question number four. Hold on a second. How often is a denitrification filter, for example, the plus reactor, aerated? A, several times a day, B, once an hour, C, once per day, D, never. Few of you are hesitating on this one. Must be a harder question. <laughs> okay, we'll give it a couple more seconds. I think it's just poorly worded. It's okay. All right, we have 87% answering. We're going to close the poll. The answer is never. We don't want to aerate a D night filter. Uh, a lot of you picked A several times a day. Guess we'll move on. Yeah, so the, the reason for that is because the denitrification happens under anoxic conditions because the bacteria, as I said, are they're they want to use whatever is easiest to breathe with, as it were. So if they have available oxygen, they'll use it. If they don't, then they'll be forced to use the nitrate. So, so in in a in a SAGB, the uh, the bacteria form in a biofilm that's uh, attached to uh, the media. So biofilm is is as this descript this definition says an organic polymer gel attached to a solid at a solid liquid interface. So it's it's the the bacterial growth on the media which is submerged in the liquid. Um, and it's it's comprised of colonies of microorganisms. So you've got the uh, heterotrophs, the autotrophs, uh, the extracell polymetric substances, and uh, 
inorganic particles, dissolved compounds. So these EPS, I think, are the uh, are the, the gelatinous portions. Just sort of a, a sketch of what what you see in this biofilm. So the the media is on the on the right hand side here, on the left hand side, sorry, and then you've got the biofilm surrounding the media and the the liquid on the outside of this uh, biofilm. And inside this media, you have autotrophic, heterotrophic, and, uh, and and these two types of bacteria. So as if you if you look at it, so so working from right to left, you have this fairly well oxygenated water, and as it penetrates the biofilm, it carries the oxygen with it, and you're you're able to to nitrify here, and then as it as it uh, penetrates deeper, you actually lose some of the oxygen, and so you can actually denitrify in this in this in this this biofilm. So you you can you can grow all all the classes of bacteria that uh, that allow you to nitrify, denitrify, and and convert uh, BOD uh, remove it actually. So so it has it has quite a lot going on in this biofilms. There's a, we did some uh, biomass density and just as, just you've got different flows through the system generate different, uh, different levels of biofilm. And what's, what's interesting about this is the fact that you, even at the, at these low flows, you still have this biofilm. It's just not nearly as, as, as dense and uh, so, so you got uh, concentrations of biofilm again 7,000 15 milli 15,000 milligrams per liter uh, of your your volatile solids so it's a it's a it performs it it provides a, a really excellent means of, of treating wastewater uh, some of the applications for uh, for the submerged attached with bioreactors, you've got uh, you can handle uh, various flows. Uh, we've got systems that handle from 440 gallons per day, the single family systems, to uh, a 600,000 gallon a day commercial uh, that uh, services the town. Um, so we've got uh, one in one in Pennsylvania and the, the large one is in North Carolina. So it and it and it works well. It's very energy efficient and uh, and you know fairly very flexible. So because the design is based purely on uh, on flow loading, so you know your load's not as big for a single family, but it's the same technology works when you've got load for a small town. Uh, it, it, it's been applied in schools, commercial developments, like housing developments, uh, uh, restaurants, and seasonal resorts. And seasonal resorts are, are notorious for having, you know, off season, they, their flows drop to almost nothing. And extended air plants and some of the others just cannot handle a lack of food but uh, SAGB is able to handle that fairly well. Uh, for some design points, now these are design points we use for, for our design. Uh, we got 40 pounds of, of ammonia nitrogen per thousand cubic feet of media. And so this is our, our conversion of the, of the TKN to uh, to uh, nitrate, and then we designed for 150 pounds of BOD removal per thousand feet cubic feet. Uh, now these removal rates are affected by cold temperatures. So, so if you're designing for one in uh, in Florida, this may be good in the winter time too. But you get up to to Minnesota where we have systems. This 40 pounds may drop to 20. It's uh, if you're familiar with the uh, 
like RVC, there's some very well noted uh, data for RVCs. It these these uh, you know you'll you'll find that that the temperature correction for RBCs, we follow something similar to that. Uh, but all of the designs are, all the systems are based on the influent wastewater load. That's the pounds removal and uh, minimum temperature. So, uh, so you don't have off the shelf systems with SAGVs usually. So we got a, another poll question. Okay, um, poll question number five. What are some typical applications for the SAGV? Select one. Okay, we'll give it a couple more seconds. Looks like everyone's voted. And the answer is all of the above. Looks like the majority of you picked the right answer. All right, we'll move on. Okay. So one of the things uh, the SAGB is really good at is hitting some uh, fairly stringent and, and consistent discharge limits. So you've got We've got several systems out there that I know of. We had uh, BOD of less than 10, typically it's less than 30, TSS typically less than 30, and then the total nitrogen of less than 10. Uh, if you had stringent reuse limits, uh, we've got a system that hits less than three consistently, so I know the submerged SAGBs can do this. Uh, you had UV disinfection, perhaps microfiltration if you need to. And then uh, recently with some of the, the newer regulations coming out, uh, total organic carbon of less than three or cases sometimes in Massachusetts less than one. And so with some supplemental uh, equipment, uh, the SAGBs were able to, to hit all of these limits with our, with our system at any rate. And you can Achieve phosphorus removal by chemical addition. Uh, we use multi point injection. Uh, again, it's purely a physical removal. Uh, biological removal, if you try doing things biologically for phosphorus, if you don't keep on top of it, the phosphorus isn't bound completely and so it will re release if you're not careful. Um, and then, um, one of the advantages for uh, that we've seen for the SAGB is uh, when compared to an MBR, uh, the operational cost is is substantially less. So uh, we've got uh, a SAGB set up with microfiltration that operates at about a dollar thirty three a thousand gallons. This was a number of years ago, but still the the cost of electricity has you know, just gone up. So, so these would be proportional. And then the MBR is uh, you know, almost three times the cost for electrical operation. And again, one of the advantages that we've we discussed earlier is uh, got equivalent uh, suspended growth MLSS of. 8,000 to 17,000 milligrams per liter. And it's a very stable, uh, you know, gross you know, it's MLSS value. Uh, MBR typically operates at about 8,000 to 10,000. So it's very, very similar. And uh, now poll question six. Sure. Um, let's see. Well, question number six. Name three features of a SAGB system. High level of nitrogen removal, 
ease of operation, lower cost of operation, flexibility with incoming flow and wastewater concentration, or all of the above. Give it a couple more seconds. Looks like the majority of you have voted. We'll close the poll and share the answer. Yes, 99% of you picked all of the above. Um, obviously, it does remove a lot of nitrogen. It's easy to operate, and we just covered that low cost of operation. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility with flow and concentrations coming in. Okay. We'll continue on, Andrew. Thank you. So, uh, so this is a, a system, again, the one I'm familiar with is our infodrome system. Uh, you've got uh, a single train. What this has is the, the inoculant tank followed by a, a reactor and uh, that is your SAGB. And then the clear well contains your nitrified wastewater. Uh, the system does some recycling to actually allow the main reactor to denitrify as well because it's leveraging the carbon source in the anoxic tank. And then the smaller filter called the plus reactor is another SAGB that is a dedicated denite filter. So there's no aeration, it does backwash with an air scour but that's the only air it's ever delivered and then your uh, final discharge which is uh, your denitrified wastewater and and you know BOD is taken on everything uh, from here I think I'm actually turning this over to Eric Hess if you'll give me a second We also have several questions that come in, so we'll uh, hold the questions till the end and try to get some answers. Okay. All right. So, Eric, are you there? Yeah. Okay. So, I took that first slide, but I think the rest are yours. Yeah, I lost the uh, slides. I'm not looking at the presentation now. Sorry. How about now? No. Oh, okay. Well, I know what I did. Sorry. Andrew, it looks like you closed the presentation. Oh, great. <laughs> I thought he just made Eric the presenter. <laughs> I did. Are you the presenter, Eric, or did I just screw up totally? Yeah, I don't see the presentation now. Okay, let me go back. <laughs> All right, so I think, uh, let me try something, sorry. Okay. That better Does that work yeah it's better so uh i can advance the slides myself you should be able to all right okay we have uh the anoxic equalization tank uh these are sized based on for the application for the specific job it's, it's a dual purpose anoxic tank and equalization tank so our solids settle out in this tank. We have a uh, stilling well on the left-hand side. This is for our return from the effluent tank, and that just prevents the stirring or disturbance of the solids in the uh, equalization tank. So the influent comes in from the left, and gravity flows out to the right. It's fluctuating volume. The operator will monitor the sludge level in this tank periodically, and um, 
have the uh, sludge pumped only periodically to keep that sludge level down below the uh, T going out to the, uh, the next tank. Okay, this is a rectangular submerged attached gross by our actor. We've got, um, I'm just going to point out a few things. The back wash trough during a backwash, we introduce air and flow of F, return effluent to clean the media. The solids, any solids accumulated in a filter will flow, gravity flow into the trough and gravity feed back to the anoxic tank. The beginning of the system. So in the bottom we have a, a system of air uh, lines and block under drain to give us a nice even airflow air pattern through the entire uh, reactor. On the, the next slide. During installation of the uh, of the reactor, we do a bubble test to ensure that we have a nice even airflow across the reactor for before the media is installed in the tank. Just uh, just to give us a level of comfort, knowing that uh, we have a nice even air pattern across the, the entire system. Okay, next slide. I can't seem to advance it myself. This is the block under drain it goes over the piping. Again, this oh, gives us a nice even, spreads out the air pattern across the, the anoxic re reactor, I'm sorry. This is a circular submerged attached growth bryo reactor and it's for smaller systems or uh, and sometimes we use a dual growth by our reactor for a system, depending on the system design and working on at the time. Again, another bubble test, just ensures that the bottom of this tank is, this tank is installed a level and we have a nice even air pattern across the bottom of the tank. Next, uh, this control shed, most of our controls are in a, in a shed or in a building. Many of these now we're doing uh, prefabricated control buildings where we have the blowers, the odor control, the UV, and the control panel pre mounted and wired. It can be in a fiberglass enclosure, precast concrete enclosure, or wood enclosure. We use uh, rotary load blowers for our systems. We typically run one at a time. Very, uh, some of the benefits is we can operate these blowers at a lower speed, a lot more efficiently than you would with a centrifugal blower. We have two blowers, we alternate back and forth. And then when we do a backwash, we scour the air, we run both blowers at a higher rate of speed to give us more air, to give us that good scour of the, uh, of the reactor. So on the wall here, we see a variable frequency drive again to slow the blowers down, operate at the most efficient speed for our process air, and then we can increase the speed for our scour. We have a uh, flow chart recorder on the wall mounted. We've got a uh, electronic electric actuator that shuts the air valve piping off when the blowers are not running. Odor control, a lot of these we provide a tub scrubber. We draw across the air uh, across the top of our tanks through a mist filter, through a bed of media, and then out into the atmosphere. So we have testing ports. We can do uh, sampling of our media to determine if the saturation that needs to be replaced or changed out. UV disinfection. We have two units here in series. Manual swiper to clean the cord sleeves. We have a, a light sensor on the side of both units to monitor the uh, efficiency of the bulbs and uh, see how clean they are. We have an air release valve here at the top of our piping to remove any trapped air uh, to prevent the bulbs from overheating. 
our control panel, we have a, a large touch screen and we can uh, monitor and change process, any part of the process by through this touch screen. We can also manually operate the pumps and the blowers manually by handoff auto switches on the uh, main control panel. Again, control panel, main touch screen display indicates current operation status of the various equipment. So you can touch on the uh, touch screen and it, and it will indicate whether pump is running or not running. Here's a, another uh, schematic of the system in the bottom that is also shown on the uh, touch screen. Following pictures are taken from current and completed submerged attached growth bioreactor projects out in the field now. So we have uh, the tanks are being installed and in the background you can see this is our control shed where we have the blowers, odor control, chemical feed, and uh, any other equipment. Backfilled, we have patch covers so we have inspection access. Any pumps that are installed we are on guide rails and are wired through this disconnect junction box. So we've got a vented box and then a uh, disconnect for ease of replacing floats or pumps can be done from outside. It's very easy, it's, you know, all the wiring is in conduit. So it's very simple to change a pump out in the, in the event of a problem or a or float ball or anything else. This is a backfilled and completed job. So you can see the tanks and access covers under the grass here in our control building, I believe is here. Uh, again, containing all the process equipment. Here's an uh, overview of a system. We've got control buildings, all of our tanks, and we're doing, I believe this is a drip dispersal system through, uh, through the woods for dis final discharge. Thank you for your time. Um, okay, I can ask the questions if it uh, looks like we have about 10 minutes, maybe 15 almost, to do some questions. Um, as a reminder, too, after the questions, uh, you have to complete the survey evaluation at the end um, in order to get your credits. So the first question is, is the equivalent biomass concentration active bugs that is volatile suspended solids or non-volatile suspended solids? That is the volatile suspended solids. The volatile? So it's the, act, the active biomass, bio yeah. Okay. Um, another question is, what would happen if alkalinity is higher than 7.1 parts uh, by parts in nitrification? Well, that, what happens then is it really just passes through. Um, as, long as, as long as your pH doesn't, doesn't uh, rise like above 9, uh, a higher alkalinity really is not uh, not a big issue. Okay. And another question is, what is micro C? I think that was the carbon source used for denitrification. Oh yeah, sorry that that uh, probably is one of those things shouldn't have been mentioned because it's a uh, it's a proprietary carbon source uh, made by EOS, I believe. It's a basically it's a sh I think it's a sugar type syrup based. Uh, uh, feed um, basically comes in drums. It's not, you know, doesn't have to be an explosion proof. So it's a very, very common uh, chemical used around here for uh, for a supplemental carbon source for denitrification. Yep, I've, I've heard of it. Um, do you have any installations in New York State? We have one in uh, in Hyde Park. Uh, Eric, Eric's very familiar with that one. Do you want to say anything about that, Eric? Um, the unique, one of the unique features of that is we're direct discharging into a trout stream, and that was improved by New York State DC and uh, the state uh, for direct discharge. So um, it's been working very well. The only issue was the, their temperature requirements for discharge, um, something that we really can't control is discharge temperature, but uh, working very well down there. Good. And how many installations do you have nationwide? Um, are the majority of installations in a certain state? 
Uh, yes, we have, I think, uh, over 100 installations of the large systems. Uh, I think about 140 small family units, single family units. Uh, the single families are predominantly in New Jersey. We worked in the Pinelands, got approval there, have full approval. So we've got a large number of small systems in, in New Jersey. Uh, larger systems, we've got several, probably about, probably 60 to 70% are in Massachusetts. Uh, a lot of them down on the Cape where they've got uh, high water table and seasonal resorts and high, high, high affluent standards. And we've got like one in Minnesota, uh, one in Maryland, uh, a number, probably the next largest percentage is in North Carolina. So we're, we're spread, spread largely through the Northeast. Um, what is the maximum flow treated by SAGB? Uh, like I, I said, our our maximum de our maximum design, our largest system installed right now is six hundred thousand gallons a day. Um, as far as what it can handle, we've got uh, the the. Tetra filters, which are essentially SAGBs, they're dedicated denitrification filters on a couple of municipal plants that are, I think, what are they, five, six million gallons a day. So it's, it is a SAGB, it's just a denitrification filter. Uh, so, so I don't see that there is an upper limit. It, it, it's, uh, I can only say what we have actually designed it to so far. And right, stuff. exactly. So any the sky's the limit. It's just your current one is six hundred thousand gallons per day. Yeah. Okay. And how is biomass sloughing controlled? That's another question. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. A couple things that uh, in our system we do uh, daily backwash. Uh, the operator has the ability to either backwash daily or more frequently. And with that backwash, what it does is it is it's an air scour followed by a water air and water, it does not expand the media so much, it just sort of shakes it and carries the detritus up. There's a, there's a trough at the top of the, on top of the filter that, uh, that, oh, sorry. There's a trough in the, in the filter. Let me go back and see if I can find. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, so, so with a backwash, the water comes, from the bottom of the reactor with an air scour sends water into this trough which then sends it back to the anoxic tank where the solids then settle out in the anoxic tank and so that's how we we clear out the, the dead biomass any accumulated detritus and things on top of the reactors okay another question can you control this system remotely yes we can uh these in fact, I can show you. <laughs> the, I've got several systems online um, that I can pull up, and yes, I guess the short answer is yes. But uh, you know, nothing like a, a demo if it works. So, uh, if that works. Was a big dead one. But yes. Why are you looking for that Android? I just wanted to mention earlier, I talked about the uh, blowers. The air process air is not continuous. It's time based depending on the process required. Processing. Okay. So that saves in energy. Right. We actually, we actually have about five more questions, Andrew, if you don't mind. Okay. If I, go I don't through. mind. Go ahead. Um, has this system replaced any of the septic systems? And if yes, does it require approval from the Department of Environmental Quality? I'm not sure what environmental quality. I think they mean maybe the DEC environment. Uh, I'm not not sure. What do you mean by replacing septic systems? Because the uh, the one at Hyde Park 
was a, a replacement for a failed system. Yeah, that's I think what the question intends. Um, and it sounds like for the single family homes, it certainly is replacing a septic system. Yes, uh, actually on to that point, we we are part of the piloting. I think we have, I'm still trying to figure out why we don't have full approval on uh, down in, in Long Island. We did, uh, we were part of that piloting project and for the uh, single family systems they're doing for the Long Island and uh, and are active in there. So we have have several systems down there. We did a couple of pilots and and still waiting on final word on our approval there. So yes. Okay. Um, do you need pre-screening before the equalization tank? No. Okay. No, the okay. raw waste comes directly into the anoxic tank and is then fed into the reactors. Um, another question, how does this system compare with IFAST systems? Integrated fixed film activated sludge. Uh, uh, don't really know how to compare that. I I don't know. I okay. Yeah, I they're also simpler. they're also a fixed film biofilm media with activated sludge. It's integrating both. Um but Yeah, see this does not we can answer that offline perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll do some looking into it. You mentioned there was an installation in Maryland, is that true? That's another yes. question. Okay. Yes. Is odor control typically needed? I know you showed that picture and there's a question on odor control. It's yes. I would I would say it's recommended because a lot of these installations are are located where you need a small footprint because they're located close to housing, close to uh, to you know people and all all wastewater you know treatment generates some odors a uh, well operated amphidrome system not not terrible it's not like a a lagoon or anything or you know and because we do the returns we keep odors down in the anoxic tanks but uh, it's one of those things if people ever smell septic odors they always smell it so right. it's sort of like you know right and our odor control unit runs, you know, we can vary the speed of the blower on that to regulate the, the speed and run it most efficiently, but we can also speed it up or run it during a backwash. And that's when we have the most disturbance and the most odor generated is when we do a, do a backwash. Sure. That's when you're releasing the solids. So that would be the odorous. Um, and it, okay. One more question. I think then we'll close it up. Uh, is there a, pH, are there pH and DO meters to monitor? No, no, typically the operator will monitor pH and DO in the clear well immediately following the main reactor. Uh, uh, no, we don't really, it's a very simple system. We tend not to meter a whole lot. A lot of things can be done by operator uh, field testing and okay. uh, so they use a handheld meter, not an installed meter. Correct, yes. Okay. All right. Um, I think that was very useful, all the questions. I thank everyone for putting your questions in. Um, please download your certificate of completion as well as the PDF of the presentation. Some of the questions are answered in the presentation, such as mixed liquor concentrations um, and some of those questions that we didn't get to. Um, I thank everyone for your time and thank you, Andrew. Thank, thank you very you. much. I appreciate Thanks. your time, everyone. Thank you, thank Eric. You. Worked out really well. Any other Thanks. questions? Feel free to email uh, Sherry if you have any issues with the poll questions or your certificate, and she'll be in touch. Thank everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.